Hi folks, sorry to have been away for so long. I had hoped to have gotten back to the bench on a more regular basis, but of course, uh, this is what happens. Uh, life gets in the way of things like this. Uh, I have a coworker who's suffering from a life-threatening illness, and since he's out during the holiday season when a lot of people are on vacation, we wound up working a lot. Uh, in fact, I work Christmas Day and New Year's Day. And today, as first day off after only a seven-day stretch, would have been a 10-day had I not put in for a vacation day late last year to be off today. So anyway, I have a Sansui 1000A that doesn't belong to Steve for a change. It belongs to a friend of Steve's, and Steve had worked on this. Uh, the friend wanted it recapped and gone through. And when Steve replaced all the capacitors, he wisely brought it up on the dim bulb tester and said it glowed really brightly. So he says he thought he had done something wrong. And uh, he had, and it's not his fault. The schematic is old and they didn't always mark the polarity on the electrolytics. And they use a voltage doubler circuit in the power supply to get 450 volts. So um, I found the problem there. And then I'll show you how I logic through that by looking at the voltages and determining what the polarity should be. But as I was going through the rest of it, I discovered there's a problem on FM. The FM is okay and in fact pulls in a lot of channels, a lot of stations, so it has good selectivity and sensitivity, hallmarks of a good tuner. But there's a problem in the multiplex. And I'll show you the uh, tuner section and we'll talk about the multiplex and why I believe it's time to change out some capacitors in there. Uh, before I go any further, I did have a video uh, ranting about the changing of capacitors as a repair. And I stand by that. And I got a lot of pushback from people that say there are good reasons to recap. And I said that there were in that video. Well, one of the things was old tube equipment. And uh, any solid state stuff from the 60s is just getting to the point now where that stuff's got to go. Um, this is going to have to have some capacitors changed out in the multiplex section. We'll talk more about that when we look at it. So this is the tuner section here. And of course, the tuning wheel with the uh, string on is a dead giveaway. Um, this is interesting in that it has three tubes in it. And two of those tubes are new vistas. These little guys right here. Uh, here's, here's what they look like. Uh, these were popular in TV and radio tuners right before solid state started to rule the roost and did away with tubes altogether. But um, they are commonly used in late model. And this is probably in 1969, 1970, I'm going to guess. And um, <clears throat> the tuner, like I said, is OK. We're going to want to take a look over here at the multiplex section. So let me just rotate this a little bit. And of course, it's going to hit the tripod. So here we are. If we look down here, there are several paper and oil capacitors in here that we're going to have to look at, probably change out. I ordered film caps. I had pulled this electrolytic. This is one microfarad at 150 volts. And as you can see here, it measures significantly less than that with high ESR. So I went to order uh, one microfarad at 150 volt, and they were like $5 each. But 160 volt, they were less than a dollar. So of course, a few volts more is not going to hurt anything. So we're going to pull these one at a time and change them out. I have a schematic for this. I don't know how accurate it is for the multiplex section, but... Um, I have already found some differences between the schematic and the unit I have here. And I've looked at two different ones, which are different from each other, but also different from this. Uh, one thing, if you remember the Scott I worked on, somebody had changed out these dipped silver mica capacitors. They've, I don't think I've ever seen a bad one. And they're chosen for their stability in certain circuits, usually resonant circuits. You don't want to change them. They're usually not at fault. However, the paper and oil and the electrolytics, especially if you look at the proximity of this electrolytic, which is the one microfarad I spoke about, right next to this tube, 
it was just going to have a limited lifespan due to the heat alone. So we're going to change out everything in here, like I said, one at a time. But before I do, I'm going to hook it up and let you hear it in mono and stereo. And then I'll show you the waveform and show you where the problem lies. Okay, I want to demonstrate what this is doing. Um, the FM indicator isn't working, but I know the neon lamp's good because I snapped a picture of it. When you first turn it on, it lights up until the uh, tubes warm up and the power supply stabilizes, and then it goes back out, never comes on again. So that's also indicative of a problem in the multiplex section. I'm going to play stereo and then mono. And it's normal to have a little more noise in stereo, but there's a lot more noise here. And I'm going to have to be careful I don't run afoul of YouTube's copyright, because it really exhibits itself on music. And this music is all copyrighted, so I'm going to have to be very brief, but hopefully you'll get the idea of what's going on. Okay, I really can't let it go any longer than that. Hang on, the mic's by the speaker. But hopefully you get the idea there's a lot of distortion. And I'm going to feed the signal generator in, and you will see in mono it looks great. But when we go to stereo, the problem exhibits itself. This is the signal generator output from the receiver. And it is, it's currently in mono. And you might see that there's a little bit of crap running through here. But that's just the 19 kilohertz subcarrier pilot signal. If I turn it off, you can see it cleans up the sine wave. But that looks good. The problem comes when we go from any mode other than mono. So if I go to left equals minus right or right equals minus left, you can see we have a serious problem here. And if we go to left only, right only, we have issues. There's a problem in the multiplexer. As I said, it looks good in mono. But anything but, and we have problems. I changed out capacitor C51, which is supposed to be a 10 microfarad 12 volt on this schematic. There was a 10 microfarad 16 volt in there, and it measured truly bad. If you look, look at this picture, you can see it's about 110 picofarads and 277 thousand ohms of ESR that's just bad so replacing that seems to have fixed our problem you see our wave shape looks a lot better our separation is still not great but we're on the road I'm going to replace all the rest of these and then see if we need to go through an alignment I finished replacing all the other paper and oil capacitors and it seems to have straightened everything out if you look now when I go to the next mode, which is right equals minus left, we have our signal, our two sine waves out of phase, which is normal. The signs, the signs could be better, but our separation is certainly a lot better. And if you look at the front of the unit, We now have our stereo indication. I turn the pilot off, we lose it. Turn it back on, we have it. Had it. Had to touch the tuner to get it to come back on. But it looks like everything's working okay, so I'm going to put some audio through it and we'll listen and see if it sounds any better. It should. Animal in a simple car crash. Okay, so <coughs> excuse me, I have the microphone by the speaker. All they do, rolling the dice with the wrong law firm can be disastrous. Call us on your cell phone at Pound Law, pound five two nine. It's so easy. Injured? Dial Pound Law or visit forthepeople.com for an office near you. Now I tried this on music and it's definitely a lot better, as I expected it would be. <clears throat> but anyhow, I think this is pretty much done. The only other thing I want to talk about is where Steve got messed up putting the uh, capacitors in. And also I want to talk a little bit about paper and oil capacitors and leakage. And when we talk about leakage, we're talking about electrical leakage, not actual fluid like you have sometimes when electrolytics let go. 
This is my leakage uh, test setup. It's kind of cumbersome, as you can see. Basically, it's this old Sprague Tell Ohm mic, and I'm just using it for a DC power supply because it puts out, God, I think five, 600 volts. These capacitors are rated at 400 volts. I'm not sure how much they see when they're in circuit. And I checked all of them, and this is the only one that shows any appreciable leakage. So you can watch the voltage climb here and the leakage current here. Ideally, you have none. This single digit here is just the meter, I guess, just being old and out of calibration. But as we ramp the voltage up, you'll begin to see our current climb. And that's not supposed to happen. The whole point of um, capacitors is to have them block DC. You can see it's starting to climb. So we're already at a, about a third of a milliamp. And like I said, this shouldn't leak at all. So this one is starting to break down. All the other ones were still good. Okay, so now I'm going to show you on the schematic the problem that uh, Steve had found. This is a small section of the power supply schematic. If we look here, we have a diode here and a diode here. And these two capacitors, which are polarized electrolytics, are stacked up. They are 300 volts each. And this is 478 volts at the output. Now, they don't mark the polarity on the schematics. But we can figure out that if that's 478 volts there, that this better be positive. And we can also extrapolate because this dark line goes over on the other side of the schematic and goes to ground. So we know that this has to be negative. Therefore, this has to be negative here. And this has to be positive there. Like I said, once you look at it and logic it out, it's a lot easier to figure out than when you are actually looking at the unit itself. N newer schematics, you'll find that these are always marked in, but on older ones like this, it may be, they may not be. But in any event, that was an error that he had made, and he wisely started up on the dim bulb so it caused no damage, and I was able to rectify that with no problem. So anyhow, this guy is fixed. I'm going to let Steve know. Or he'll probably be notified when this video comes out. And uh, that's all I have to do on this one. Until next time, folks, I thank everyone for watching. And as always, I like giving back to the community that's given me so much. Happy New Year, everybody.